spectral CT in neurocardiology. So that's a bit of a strange title, but it is one of the titles that's come up as a art recent article. And what is neurocardiology? You have neurocardiology affecting the head to the heart, like in stress cardiomyopathy. So that's related to stress, psychological stress, stress. It can be physical stress. And this can lead to a left ventricular dysfunction of your heart. So it's an overactivation of your sympathetic um, nerves and it releases catecholamines and it stuns the heart. And you get an apical ballooning. As you can see here on the MR, this is a two-chamber MRI, cine with left atrium, left ventricle. And you can see this is an apical ballooning. So the, the apical part, the distal part of the heart is stunned and doesn't contract anymore. And this is not related to coronary artery disease. Most often, this happens in middle-aged women. And as an example, my husband's a cardiologist, and his, this lady, middle-aged lady, was letting out a small little dog, and a doberman came and ripped apart her dog before her eyes. And of course, she collapsed with a stress cardiomyopathy. What also happens is if you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have an aneurysm in your head and it bleeds, it gives the worst headache you've ever had in your life and you really think you're going to die. So it gives a lot of stress, and that also leads to this catecholamine release. And they also, some of them, about 25%, have a temporary dysfunction of your left ventricle. The good news is it usually have a spontaneous recovery, as in this woman, you have this on the first MRI, and six weeks later, you repeat the MRI or the ultrasound, and it is normal again. The whole heart is normal. What else we know is that cardiovascular disease is related to cognitive decline. And as we're growing older, if you don't die from cancer or from a stroke or from a heart attack, you will probably get dementia, mild cognitive repair leading to dementia. And this is related to repetitive strokes, myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. And with aging, we get more atherosclerosis, and this also leads to ischemic heart disease. And ischemic heart disease leads to heart failure, and this can give a chronic cerebral hyperperfusion of your brain, not enough blood coming and oxygen coming to your brain. And because the heart is not contracting properly, you can get thrombi in your heart. And one of the main, um, the main problems with older people is they get atrial fibrillation, and with that they can get thrombus in their left appendage of their atrium, the left atrial appendage. So eventually all this leads to cognitive decline. If we look at cardiombolic stroke, it's 25% of the ischemic stroke. And it's also part of the cryptogenic stroke. And what is cryptogenic stroke? If we don't find a cause of the stroke, so you don't have a tight, uh, a, a tight stenosis of your carotid artery, or we don't find a different reason or dissection, we're looking for a cause, and we often don't find a cause. So if the, and what's the problem is that if you have atrial fibrillation, it doesn't always show up on that electrocardiogram when you come into the hospital because it can be paroxysmal, so it can be there and it can be gone and it can come back again. So what you really need then is a continuous electrocardiogram monitoring for days and you need to check these patients. Of course, that all takes time. And what's the best moment to evaluate the heart is when the patient is in the hospital with their stroke. And it can be difficult to find that thrombus in the left atrial oracle seen here in stroke. It can be difficult to find it with transthoracic echocardiogram, which is the standard, because you can't actually visualize that left atrial appendage very well. So you're doing that along the sternum, and you can often visualize the heart and the atrium, but it's difficult to visualize the atrial appendage. And you can do a transesophageal, so you pause past the echo you pass the, the probe into your esophagus, but obviously it's going to be quite difficult on a stroke patient who might have problems with swallowing. And you do need to treat these patients because they have, first, a much higher risk of stroke, and they have a much higher risk of recurrent stroke. So you need to give them antithrombolytics. And cardioembolic stroke, the most important one is the atrial fibrillation that we can find on CT. 
Of course, we have a myocardial infarction with this in black, infarct in white, and the thrombus in black. Heart failure, as I was saying, if the heart doesn't contract properly anymore, you will get stasis of flow and possible thrombus. A patent foramen ovale, so as a baby, you have a patent foramen ovale and a patent botaliduxus to keep the flow circulation going through your lungs and through your body, and normally it shuts. But about 25% of us still has a patent foramen ovale, so there's a connection between the left and the right side. We can have problems with our valves from endocarditis, and we can have tumors, but that is quite seldom. So our standard protocol is from the aortic arch up to the brain, and we can evaluate the cervical, the carotids, and the vertebral arch and the aortic arch, so that is great. Except with a problem like this, 51-year-old lady who collapsed in the kitchen, she was already in coma in the ambulance, and she has an aortic dissection, which luckily we do see on this scan, because it's from the aortic arch up, and they did this quite low, and we see there is a match defect on both sides of the brain. So theoretically, she cannot recover from this. So in our hospital, we said this is hopeless. We're not even going to try to, to operate or to do an endovascular treatment of this because her, she's really going to be brain dead. And the neurologist didn't accept that, so they moved her an ambulance to Amsterdam, and she died there on arrival. So what we now do is we extend the CTA, the stroke CTA, to cover the heart. So we go right down to below the heart. It's non-ECG gated. So we've been doing this on our ICT. We now do it on our spectral CTs. And this means that you don't use, you're using the same contrast bonus. It doesn't cost you a lot of extra radiation dose. And certainly less contrast and less radiation than if you do a separate cardiac CT. ECG gated CT. This is, this is a non ECG gated CT. So, of course, you do have some motion artifacts, but with the current CTs, it, you do get excellent performance and visualization. So, with this, has a, this is the middle cerebral artery. We have a very distal stroke here in this 68 year old man. We have hardly any um, infarco in your CBF map. We have quite a large area on your MTT, so there's enough penumbra. And on the CT angiography, left ventricle, left atrium, left atrial appendage, we see there a filling defect that's homogeneous and lower than 100 Hounsford units. This is thrombus. Here, Hounsford units of 57. The patient is treated, and on follow-up MRI, the thrombus has disappeared. And we know from previous studies that CT angiography is comparable to transesophageal echocardiography, and certainly better than transthoracic esophageography. It's, it doesn't have to be ECG um, triggered because they have your non-ECG triggered spectral CT, but even a non-spectral CT, you get excellent results. And if you measure your iodine and iron density, so on the conventional map, it should be below 100, below 100 Hounsford units, it should be homogeneous, and you should have a sharp border. With your density map and you measure it, if it's below 1.5, you can be quite sure this is a thrombus. So two cases, this case of a patient with a posterior ischemic lesions on both sides of the brain. There is a, an occlusion of the P2 segment, posterior cerebral artery on the right, but also proximal on the P1 segment on the left. We see there is a large thrombus, it is homogeneous, it has a sharp border, it's below 100 Hounsford units, and if we really want to know, we can measure it, and it's below 1.5 milligrams per milliliter, we know this is thrombus. And this patient was not known with atrial fibrillation, so this is the first presentation, and you've proved it's a cardioembolic source. Another patient who has an M2, again, quite distal occlusion. Again, here we don't see infarct on the CBV. We see quite a large defect here on the MTT map. And we see there's a thrombus. We think there's a thrombus here in the apical part of the left ventricle. But I guess this is being read by non-expert radiologists in the middle of the night or by our residents. So it's quite difficult. But if we say, 
measure. Measure it. You've got the spectral information. You can enhance the contrast around the thrombus with your mono ease, and you can measure in the thrombus. And again, this was below 1.5 milligrams per milliliter. So this is a thrombus in your left ventricle. And sometimes we see these strange things. This is actually a scan for pulmonary emboli, and they were post-COVID, and the COVID was worsening. So you can see there, there's ground glass appearance here. It's getting worse. On the first CT, no pulmonary emboli, no problems in the aorta. On the second CT, there's a filling defect here, quite strange triangular filling defect in the ascending aorta. And if we measure it, 0.05 milligrams per milliliter, this is thrombus. But because we still have difficulty believing the information coming from the spectral CT, we did a retrospective gated aortic scan, and this confirms the thrombus which is dancing here in your ascending aorta, waiting to embolize to the brain or to the rest of your body. But believe your spectral information. And again, with this patient, we did see with the mono ease, on this normal conventional CT, we see no real changes in the brain, but we do see ischemic changes here if we use the low monoenergetic KV. We've had two Dutch studies that have been running in the Holland Mind the Heart, so it used an ECG-triggered CT angiography of the heart. This has been in Amsterdam, and we're still waiting for the end results. And the enclosed in Utrecht, where we're using most of the time dual energy spectral CTs, but also the ICT, um, no ECG triggering, as I showed, and to look for early detection of thromboembolic sources. And the preliminary findings were that we found that 12% 12 12 percent of the patients had a cardiac thrombus and most of them in the left atrial appendage but also in the left ventricle and some patients in both and what was especially useful to discern to differentiate between thrombus and slow flow is using your iodine density maps so in conclusion stroke we've already decided it also happens in 25 percent of patients below 65 years old 25 percent of that are cardioembolic strokes. So use your CT on admission, your CT stroke, by extending it to cover the heart. And it was especially useful for that atrial fibrillation related thrombus in your left atrial appendage. And that is the biggest cause of stroke in older people. And use your in spectral CT information, especially those iodine density maps are gonna help you differentiate thrombus from slow flow. And the, the suboptimal CTAs can be boosted by your monoenergetic parameters. And of course, as I said before, you need a good collaboration between neurologists, cardiologists, and radiologists, especially if you find any suspect findings on your cardiac CTA, you have to talk to the cardiologist that they can try and confirm that with their own imaging. Thank you very much.